structures that try to resemble the walls of this gallery are going to be sucking, squeezing, embracing uh, bodies coming in and out uh, of this space, not during events, um, but the rest of the gallery hours. We invite you um, to come and visit us uh, uh, when that occurs. Welcome everyone uh, again to one of the storefront for art and architecture series today. We are here to celebrate uh, yet again the birth of a new issue of volume, one of the magazines that we all uh, learn to love and to hate um, throughout the years of architectural education, trying to teach us the limits of what was possible to be imagined as an architectural question, from uh, some of the most celebrated issues on power to questions um, that have to do with uh, sustainability, if you want. One has been trying to understand some of the most challenging questions from very different angles. Um, as I was coming uh, today here, I was looking that actually Irma Boom, the designer of this uh, last issue, is celebrating her anniversary today. So I want to uh, uh, send her uh, congratulations for Thank one you, more yeah. year of her life. But uh, today we're celebrating a lot of things. So. The definition series was born out of the desire of trying to understand how maybe 10, 20, 50 years from now uh, we look back into these times and choose the words um, that uh, define a particular time and how in fact those words are not only part of a dictionary of received definitions but are a dictionary of constructed definitions. Uh, the diversity of voices that we're going to have today maybe are not diverse enough and maybe they are not um, um, at the same time uh, uh, in consonance enough to actually be able to produce one definition out of this event, but uh, the volume in and of itself is an attempt to try to address some of those larger questions. Um, I don't want to uh, introduce every one of the speakers tonight, they are pretty amazing, all of them, you have read those already. I want to thank Nick for uh, actually being part of the storefront in so many different guises and in so different, many, so many different forms. Um, never so high in the space. I don't think anyone has ever been this high. So um, without any further delay, I again invite, invite everyone to join us, to climb, to jam our bodies. We are going to be speaking from the different corners of this room. So please, let's say happy birthday to value, volume. Welcome, shelter, and thanks, Nick. Okay. Thank you, Eva. Um, thank you everyone for, for making it out tonight. I mean, again, there's people standing, but there's also a lot of space over here. You can't really see it from over there, but um, I mean, I, I, do, I do greatly encourage you to, to come on the space. Um, it's very easy to come in behind the panel over here, yep. so you're welcome. And I mean, it's, it, it's kind of funny to have this event in, in this installation, because if you read the text um, uh, describing and, and how the, you know, what, what this installation is trying to do, um, it, it's trying to reconfigure our kind of our corporeal understanding of architecture and how you know our, our walls are not quite so static, but you know that there is an incredibly dynamic relationship between our bodies and the space and the architectural uh, surroundings of it. And, and this um, is is actually a notion that that we touch upon in shelter in various ways in this issue. Um, so. Uh, we're, we're all here today um, to celebrate, I guess, two things. Um, one is the launch of the new issue of Volume, um, which is our 46th issue. Um, but also, this is the last issue of our 10th year of existence. Um, so this is our, our, I guess, the end of our 10-year anniversary. Um, and actually, earlier today, as some of you might have seen on, on, on social media, um, in Amsterdam, in Hotel Droog, we also had a... We also had a party um, with our editor-in-chief and, and director um, to commemorate the event as well. Um, but so uh, the, the focus of this, uh, of this event will be, will be the launch, but it's also important to, uh, to, to I think, recognize, um, I think, the significance of, of picking the topic of shelter at this, at this point uh, in time in our own legacy um, in the past, uh, you know, having just finished our 10-year anniversary, um, but continuing uh, an editorial project that actually started in 1929. Um, so in, in, our first, uh, in our first issue, um, if any of you are lucky enough to have it or to be able to find it in the library, um, you, you, you can find Mark Wigley, uh, one of our founding fathers, um, when he was dean of, of uh, GSAP at Columbia. Um, you can see him provide some incredibly illuminating reflections on, on, the, on the role that 
um, on, on the relationship between architecture and shelter and how the architect is tasked at continually redefining and rediscovering what this very primordial uh, what this very primordial condition of shelter means um, today, and it's exactly it's act it's exactly this impetus which is which gave the force behind this issue. Um, so, I mean, in in in, in response to, uh, to to something that Eva said, you know, that we might that in this issue of um, of volume that we are you know perhaps articulating a singular definition of of shelter, and I I, I would say that we're not necessarily trying to put forth one specific definition of shelter, but we are trying to to position shelter as a as a very as an operative concept that by defining it we advance architecture. So we are not trying to put forth one singular definition. We are trying to almost source definitions and, and understand how people interface uh, their their practice with this with this more yeah fundamental notion. Um, so the the way you know, as a launch, um, I've been lucky enough to be able to invite five of our contributors from our magazine uh, of this issue um, to be here with us today. They're kind of scattered throughout the room, um, and they will be presenting um, <coughs> their uh, their interpretation of what shelter means today through their own individual practices, their own mentalities, their own ideas, their own politics. Um, and so, I will what what. The way that this event will uh, will be running um, is that I will give a uh, let's say 10, 15 minute editorial introduction to uh, you know digging a bit deeper into why it is we're actually talking about uh, shelter and I think what it means to talk about shelter today. Um, then each of the uh, each of the participants are going to be presenting, like I said, their their individual definitions, um, and then afterwards I'm hoping that that this that this original question of you know, what does it mean to talk about or to reconsider, to redefine shelter today? I'm hoping that this is also a discussion that we can not only have amongst the participants, but also to amongst all of us in general. Um, so, uh, with that, uh, I would, yeah, I guess like to start my presentation if you can start uh, my slides. And can I get the, the, the yes. clicker? And does anyone have an issue <coughs> that I can use for a second? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's for bios. Uh, okay, so uh, volume 46 shelter, uh, designed by Irma Boom. Uh, Irma has actually been with us for about eight years, uh, seven years, um, but you know she's still going quite strong and still making amazing work. Um, Irma, just to say a little bit about her because it is her birthday, uh, she's a book designer. This is the only magazine she does. And uh, what is really unique about this is, you know, magazines can very easily fall into templates, but she really crafts each issue as as an object, as a as as a as a design, as as a design in and of itself. So each is unique, each is a project of her of herself. So, um, shelter number forty six. Uh, so, if any of you uh, saw the, the the Facebook event, um, you saw an image as the cover header, uh, which was at the same time probably quite familiar, but at the same time, uh, yet yeah, unfamiliar. Um, this this is probably the image of Hans Holin's <coughs> Mobile Bureau that uh, that we are used to seeing uh, uh, a man Hans Holin sitting in a bubble in a field with a drawing board with you know a tube providing air. Um, and when, when this image came out in 1969, uh, and, and still to this day, it resonates profoundly to, to say that, you know, this is what is necessary to work today. That this, is, this is effectively all that's, all that's needed, is we need uh, a protective barrier, we need air, and we need, you know, this is almost better than a lot of offices. It has sunlight, it has, uh, you know, you're on grass, which is much more comfortable than hardwood floors, etc. But so, I mean, th th this is the image that I think to me, when, when, when starting with the idea of shelter, it, it speaks so loudly at a reconsideration of what this concept means. But if you actually look further, th this image in, in its uncropped version is, is a bit more complex and it, and it shows, uh, it, it shows you know, a, a film man and what looks like a director and then, then a cinematographer um, and you know, some, some poles of, 
supporting who knows what to the side. And w when, when I saw these two images in relation to each other, um, it, it made it quite evident to me that there, there's perhaps a dissonance between the, the image of shelter um, and what it actually takes to produce that image. And I think what, what we're trying to do with this, uh, with this issue of shelter is to, is to, let's say, deconstruct the image of shelter and try and re return to one of its more, uh, what, one of its, its more uh, conceptual roots. Um, so if, if you look for this, for this image, and this is kind of an aside, uh, if you look for this image online, what you may not find is this, you know, the clean cropped version, but you'll find this. Uh, this is actually what's on Hans Holin's page, and it, it's, it's a little bit of, a, of like a funny gesture, because you can see the corner of the camera um, still <laughs> left in the crop on the right-hand side, so it's kind of a, it's a very small gesture to, you know, to look beyond the frame of this image and to see what it actually means to, to make such a statement. Um, but so, you know, if, if we're, if, with, with talking about shelter, uh, we kind of had to, let's say, go back to basics. Um, you know, the, the, the idea of shelter is most immediately identified with that of the primitive hut. Um, and there's been some people, including an issue of San Rocco, that has tried to reconsider the primitive hut today. Um, and the primitive hut was most polemically first put forth by uh, Marc-Antoine Lagier in 1753 with his essay on architecture. Um, but what's interesting about, about these publications, which is the first thing that I, that I kind of picked up on, <laughs> now th this, this is what the first page is of, uh, of the essay on architecture. Um, now, when, when architects think of this essay, they get an image in their mind that is incredibly powerful. And that image is this, what we see on the left, of, of, of you know, a, a woman, a goddess, pointing to the, what an artist interprets to be as the primitive hut, um, and a cherub kind of gesturing towards it. Um, but so this image was actually only produced uh, in its reprinting in, in 1755. Um, so when this, when this essay first came out, it had no image. It was... It was a, an essay, it was a historical treatise, but it was also, and what, what I would like to focus on, it was a narrative, it was a fiction. And it was only once it started to be noticed that an image that has become so iconic and emblematic of the primitive hut um, has, has come to be, has come to, came to be. Um, now it's also interesting, in 1755, uh, the, this, uh, this text was translated into English um, with a completely different front piece. Um, which you know shows similar things, but you know it's a it's a group of men building um, building this structure, which is uh, this is the English translation you know, printed in England, a very different kind of cultural politics of the image here. Um, but so I I want to I want to focus on this image because it's really in this image that I think uh, has basically because there is this image we as architects think that shelter is not an issue anymore that that, that we do not need to rethink it we we and and i mean I'll, I'll i'll get to this to this further on but i want to talk a little bit about what this image actually is um because to me this is not an image this is a diagram um and to, it, d despite its its representational style uh that that is that is deceptive this is this is not an image um, so if you, if you read the first page of Essay on Architecture, in the first chapter, um, there's, there's this incredibly captivating story, which is at the same time very politically problematic in today's language, but I'll, I'll maybe just uh, to, to read a little bit about it, it's, it's very literary, so it, it will hopefully make sense. Um, so, let us look at man in his primitive state, without any aid or guidance other than his natural instincts. He is in need of a place of rest. On the banks of a quietly flowing brook, he notices a stretch of grass. Its fresh greenness is pleasing to his eyes. Its tender down invites him. He is drawn there and stretched out at leisure on this sparkling carpet. He thinks of nothing else but enjoying the gift of nature. He lacks nothing. He does not wish for anything. But soon, the scorching heat of the sun forces him to look for shelter. So what does this primitive man do? This primitive man first goes to the forest, which he finds very delightful, uh, provides with shade, but it rains and it, it cannot keep him dry. So what does he do then? He still needs to look for shelter. 
he goes to a cave, which is great. It's dry and it's shaded, but it stinks. It creates a foul air. So finally, this primitive man decides to okay. Well, I'm gonna use my uh, I'm gonna use my skills. I'm gonna use my human intelligence uh, to to do something about this. Um, so what what he says? And now this is in 1755 English. It's it's a it's a short quote. Resolved to supply by his industry the inattentions and neglects of nature. The man is willing to make himself an abode which covers, but does not bury him. So, so after, after reading this, this, you know, it's maybe 300 words, 500 words, um, and seeing this image, I, 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 which I just said is not an image, I, I could, I, I started to see this not so much as a representation of architectural form, but I, I started to see it as a diagram of relations. And not just as a diagram of relations, but as within this, what, what lays beneath this image, a very particular definition of shelter, which I think, I don't want to say it is timeless, but I do think it is profoundly relevant for today. So. We are in a definition series here. So if I am to, let's say, start making my own definitions. Shelter is not a noun. Shelter is a verb. This here is not architecture because we look at it and see it as architecture. It is architecture because it is performing as such. If, if there is something that, that is shelter, that we could call a shelter, it is because it shelters not because it is a shelter. <laughs> so, when, 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 this, when this issue came out, people were posting on Facebook, and I know that this is a little bit cliche, but you know, Patrick Schumacher responded, um, you know, saying, architecture as shelter is the most misleading commonplace that misses the whole point of our discipline. And seeing, seeing this image in, in a different way, as a diagram, I, I could not help but think that, that Patrick is, is, is missing the whole point of shelter. And maybe not architecture, but at least a very, a, a very important concept to that. And so I, I would also like to extend this uh, to, to you know, last, year's, last year's biennial and, and the, main, uh, the main exhibition curated by Rem Kuhas, The Elements of Architecture. You know, he, he was asking, you know, what are the fundamental elements of architecture? Whereas really, with, with, this, with this issue of shelter, we're asking, you know, first and foremost, what are the elements that need to be sheltered from? And how can we define, or how can we think of architecture in relation to that? We're, we're starting with, with the diagram of relations first, and then asking what architecture means within that. And I think what, what, we, will, what we will see in the presentations today um, is that the, the, the world that we live in you know, and, and the way that our notions of shelter play out in it are, are radically changed in architecture. We do not know how it is yet equipped to deal with that. But if we can say that there is any relation between these two concepts, which at least I myself am quite confident in saying, I, I think that we need to start rethinking this relationship and rethinking the elements. <laughs> so I, I'm talking about shelter and I have not mentioned at all the, the, the main way that shelter is at least being talked about today uh, in public discourse, which is the refugee crisis. Um, and so before I, uh, before I hand over the mic to the participants um, and be quiet myself, I know I've probably taken a good, sufficient amount of time myself, um, I, I, just want to, uh, I just want to show how the concept of shelter is operating in a in a very complex and, and non-simplistic way, even within refugee politics and the providence of humanitarian aid to them, um, in what we think of as shelters. You know, shelter is not four walls and a roof. Even Le Corbusier recognized that it had to do with privacy. It had to do with security. Even 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 Logier recognized that. Um, but for some reason, there is a notion, and I mean, I, I would be very happy to, to, to blame it on this image, that we think that there is 
you know, that, that shelter is architecture reduced to its bare minimum. And that if anything, that architecture is everything that is an excess to shelter. But I, I honestly think that we do not know what shelter even means today. So let's uh, let, let's maybe just see how it has to do in yeah in, in these other um, in these other examples. Um, so the the most kind of unfortunate but blatant example um, is in let's say in IDP internally displaced persons camps. Uh, this is a screen. Uh, this is a still from Renzo Martin's Enjoy Poverty, um, where he looks at the providence of humanitarian aid and the, and the politics of it in, in the D Democratic Republic of Congo, where effectively he finds people who are working for the UN, and, and Martin's asks them, so if people want to have rain not fall on them, they need to have a logo on their building. And the only answer for that is, is yes, is yes. So the this is kind of the the first introduction to um, to to I mean the way that we think of shelter today as within the humanitarian industrial complex has been completely assumed by uh, by let's say a, a very particular political economy of the image and this uh, which is the uh, be, uh, better shelter which is a collaboration by IKEA and uh, UNRWA, the, the United Nations uh, yeah, Relief Works Agency, um, I think is very emblematic of that. Now, they, they worked um, quite hard on developing you know, a, a very you know, well-designed, well-engineered product you know, with refugees, for refugees, etc., as they say, as they, as they champion. Um, now, the, the, the shelters were meant to be designed and meant to last for three years, as refugees often stay in, in camps for 17 years on average. Um, but tents last for you know a couple of months, um, so they 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 looked to you know create a new model of humanitarian shelters, um, but as as you can actually see in in this issue of volume, we have an interview uh, between Ben Vickers and Vinay Gupta um, about a, an alternative model for the providence of shelter to refugees. Um, that you know, IKEA is one of the most profound logistical and production networks that, that our world has ever seen. There were just 10,000 of these bots, but, or sorry, it's UNHCR. Um, but yet, you know, as, as this, as this uh, caption says, you know, they cannot build enough. So if IKEA, the people who are able to manufacture the most amount of useless products at the most blinding rate cannot produce enough shelters, then I think that we're perhaps doing this, uh, I don't want to say doing it wrong, but just, you know, going about it in, in not the right way. I think our priorities are a little bit off. Um, so my, my last example, I promise I will shut up after this. Um, this is an image uh, from a refugee camp on the, uh, on, on the border between Turkey and Syria in Turkey. And this was labeled by the New York Times in 2014 as, uh, it was in an article called How to Design a Perfect Refugee Camp. Um, now, I mean, if that isn't, I think it was intentionally provocational, um, but if that is not just the wrong question to be asking, I, I don't know what is. Um, so if, if, I, if I can maybe leave this um, with one thing, it's, it's, it's really with this image, that we should, the, the thought of a perfect refugee camp should never cross our minds. If we are thinking about how to design a good refugee camp or a bad refugee camp, we are not asking the right questions. And I think that this has actually to go back to the concept of shelter. Because shelter, shelter to me, in this, in this sort of situation where we accept refugees as just a fact of the matter, of our world, then shelter is an answer. But shelter is not an answer. Shelter is a question. That if we question what shelter is, who knows? If we, if we think of shelter, as, as we will see today, as dealing with privacy, as dealing with war, as dealing with health, as dealing with security, maybe we won't even need to be asking these questions that no one really wants to be answering anyway. So, with that, I will leave it over to, uh, to the guests. Now, our, our magazine is, developed, is divided into three parts. Um, now, nicely, we have people from each part, and the, the, the three parts go up in scale. Um, one is shelter as a thing, 
the next scale is shelter as a condition, and then the scale above that is the shelter as a notion. Um, so we're actually going to go in that order of how the contributors have uh, have appeared. Um, but so I will I will introduce all of the contributors now, uh, if that's okay. So uh, first will be um, uh, wait where where Luis Alexander Casanovas Blanco. Um, it, who is a New York-based architect, scholar, and critic. Uh, he is the chief curator of the Oslo Architecture Triennial 2016, together with the After Belonging Agency, and a PhD candidate at Princeton University. Uh, then we will, let's see how the table of contents goes. We will be having Vera Van Gool. Um, Vera Van Gool is an architect, writer, and curator based in New York. Uh, she's currently the editor at Ideas City, uh, and previously, she worked for Forensic Architecture, designed a house in London, and founded MISS. Uh, then we will have <coughs> Ryan John King, um, who, uh, let me find your bio, uh, is an architect, entrepreneur, and founding member of FOAM, uh, which is a decentralized architecture office, who's working to apply blockchain technologies, which he will explain, uh, to the production of the built environment and the office form. Uh, after that, we will have Sean Monahan, uh, who is an artist, writer, and strategist behind New York, uh, in, based in New York City. He's the co-founder of K-Hole, a trend forecasting group best known for coining the term norm core. Um, and last, uh, we have Lydia Kalapoliti, who is an architect, engineer, and scholar who's currently the assistant professor at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in Troy, New York. Uh, she's founder of Eco Redux, principal of the AnaCycle Studio, uh, which is based in Brooklyn, and I believe she is actually the designer and curator of the next exhibition here at Storefront. Um, so, uh, without further ado, Luis, thank you. Uh, do you need the clicker, Eva? Consider the following scenario. May the 18th, 1988, Javits Center, New York, National, Con National Convention of the American Institute of Architecture. After addressing the architects in his closing remarks, New York City Mayor at the time, Edward Koch, is inquired about a recently released decision by the Court of Appeals that strikes down a polemic Penal Law 240.35, which the Koch administration decided to rekindle just three years before. Let me say just a few words about this one. Penal Law 240.35 was actually a post-war anti-loitering decree originally grounded in uh, the Great Depression era. It was conceived to, and I'm using the words of the law here, clean up the subways and other railroad facilities from homeless people in preparation for the 1938 warfare. So the Koch administration decided to revive this law in order to remove the masses of homeless who look for shelter in the main city's transportation parks. Actually, this phenomenon escalated, escalated during the, the 1980s, when New York experienced a rapid growth in the number of unsheltered inhabitants provoked by an admixture of socioeconomic reasons, which among others, for example, include the loss of blue-collar jobs uh, and a partial relocation of the jobs in the service sector, a nationwide cutback in social subsidies, or also the generalization of speculative real estate practices. Asked about the specific status of Grand Central Terminal, Koch complained in what is right now a famous quotation. And I'm gonna put him here, he said. These homeless people, you can tell who they are. They are sitting on the floor, occasionally defecating, urinating, talking to themselves, many, not all, but many, or even panhandling. The municipality, Koch explained, thought, uh, quoting here, that it would be reasonable for the authorities to say, you cannot stay in Grand Central unless you are in Grand Central for transportation. Reasonable, rational people, Koch said, 
would come to that conclusion, right? Uh, he was looking for the confidence of the public. He continued, not the Court of Appeals. The Court of Appeals said, no, how do you know these homeless are not there for shopping? And I know it sounds like a Donald Trump joke, but actually David Cobb was from the Democratic Party. Nonetheless, how shocked uh, we might be for these words, they actually provoked a laughter, a laughter in the audience, which was primarily constituted by architects. So, despite of the presence of homeless in public buildings all over New York, the question asked to Cobb specifically about Grand Central shows the preoccupation with the occupation of homeless people of this day. As it was pointed in an editorial in the New York Times, the presence of homeless individuals seemed, and I'm quoting here, more of an issue, and to some, no doubt, more an affront uh, in Grand Central than in other transportation facility in the city. But we might question, what made Grand Central special? What made Grand Central more important? Uh, and uh, why was people more worried about the occupation of homeless of Grand Central rather than Penn Station, Port Authority, etc.? The open had uh, the New York Times open had an explanation for that. Perhaps the upset. It is the contrast between the Beaux Arts architecture that so well embodies the architecture's aspirations and the living evidence of the wretchedness of some of its members, referring to the homeless individuals. So, we can conclude that according to the open air, there seemed to be an aesthetic disequilibrium between the lying, sometimes intoxicated subjects supported against the Botticelli, Mar Botticelli marble walls of the terminal and the actual uh, architecture of this magnificent, according here, Borsar's building. Ultimate, ultimately, what, what at least seems disturbing to me is the belief that Grand Central proved unable to swallow the homeless body within the circuit of values that Grand Central's terminal architecture was part of. <coughs> Let me go back now to Ed Koch. With the rekindling of the law, the aim of the municipality was to remove homelessness from the public, to neutralize it from the public peak. I'm using here uh, Peter Marcuse's uh, words. Peter Marcuse uh, neutralized this, uh, uh, Peter Marcuse, sorry, uh, theorized this neutralization of homeless as, uh, as for, he said that it was uh, the contradictory exposure of misery in the midst of plenty and the alienation from home in a home-based society. Homeless draw attention to problems which were not accidental or temporary inherent and structural, transparently insoluble by a private market approach. Marcus explained that any serious attempt to solve homelessness would lead to a conundrum, to a paradox, which resolution fitted the current capitalist system in two fundamental ways. First, to acknowledge that there was a problem, to acknowledge that homelessness was effectively happening, would admit the failure of the current based market system to provide shelter to everyone. But to tackle it, it would also imply its refusal, let's say, if the system works through merit meritocracy to help those unable to provide themselves with resources would contradict this meritocracy. So what to do within this web, within this dead end street? I mean, no, uh, Peter Marcus saw it clear. The only possible way here was uh, to avert the self-destruction of the system was to conceal homelessness from public view to negate the problem. Homeless, not a structural problem, not in New York, and is at least not in Grand Central. On the other hand, our historian Rosalind Deutsche pointed how Cox's argument state, uh, state in the phrase, you cannot stay in Grand Central unless you are in Grand Central for transportation, suggested that buildings in the city have an inherent natural meaning determined by the imperative that fulfill needs presupposed to be natural and simply practical. So let's say, a station provides transportation services, as well as a house provides shelter, being the conclusion here that a station does not provide shelter. In this regard, notwithstanding ruling against Koch, the arguments put forward by the court, uh, the Court of Appeals, which actually knocked down this law that uh, Mayor Koch wanted to provide, 
kind of accepted the idea of this organic use of organic, of organic, sorry, kind of accepted the idea of the organic use of organic forms. The good thing, referring to Grand Central, but also to Penn Station uh, and Perth. White concourses, along which numerous retail establishments of all kinds implicitly invite to the to the public to enter, browse and shop. <coughs> so, Grand Central could not be considered anymore a transportation facility, but should be understood as a sort of mall, as part of the city, as a street. So, furthermore, they said, as, uh, as let's say, um, Mayor Cook uh, mocked what he said, the Court of Appeals the Court of Appeals tell us, what do you think that these homeless are there for shopping? This is actually what the court thought. The homeless were paradoxically protected by their virtual reinscription within the consumerist system. That is, an economic system that could not provide them with a job, with basic services, or with a, ch with a shelter. An economic system which expelled them on the first instance. The court determined that homeless were allowed to stay in the station spaces not in response to their urgent need for shelter, but due, due to their potential condition as consumers. Ultimately, and let me conclude, maybe nowadays shelter and consumption, I mean, of course, cannot be dissociated anymore, but maybe our right to shelter is just a byproduct of having guaranteed our right to consumption. Uh, next, we're gonna have Bear. <coughs> yeah. Emma, can you just. She will likely need this. Yes. shelter were able to um, get access to by card and code. Sorry, I'm saying this completely wrong. And um, this new format of digital purchasing power for food and shelter where Cairo Amman Bank replaced card and code with retinal scans enabled refugees to access financial assistance. The introduction of digital technology in the spatial context of refuge and shelter mobilizes a virtual geography of information, such as how many refugees are there, where are they going to, but also how many are HIV positive and how many are pregnant. Incorporating the digital in context where bricks and bread would be more than enough initiates a self-eliminating hoax, seeing as how frankly it's the exact same digital technology that keeps famines in place, targets relief hospitals with drones, and leaves migrants to drown. So when we're all just one scan and click away to be saved, are we too easily and too often left to our fate? So our iris scans, our passwords, or our voicemails appear to be private to us, but are in fact not even ours. So who actually owns the digital? Rapidly developing informal economies such as in Mexico or in India now facilitate the massive offshore IT outsourcing of labor and services. What results is a gray zone of territorial data ownership. When I use my registered mobile SIM card whilst I'm traveling in New York to call my Deutsche Bank in Berlin, a help desk in New Delhi picks up. My conversation, whose operation is owned by T-Mobile UK, is downloaded and transmitted by the American service provider AT&T, stored in India by its local equipment, while its rights and content are owned by Deutsche Bank in Berlin, without ever touching German soil. So, so if transnational laws of data disobey formal jurisdiction and operate beyond physical geogra geographies, does data actually claim territory? So in 2014, during the Ukrainian um, social unrest, digital borders became spatially manifest when cell phone users near the Maiden Square received text messages saying, Dear subscriber, you're registered as a participant in a mass riot. So willingly or not, cell phone users cross the border between the good and the bad Kiev. And having 3G on your cell phone has become a political act more powerful perhaps than casting a vote. So when during the Arab Spring, 
London riots, or recent Ankara bombing, bombings, Mubarak, Cameron, or Erdogan's best defense was not to enfranchise the people, but to switch off the internet as lar at large. So while data might not be considered a threat when it passes us by, it's definitely a force we cannot monitor and therefore cannot shelter from. So, one of my favorite writers, Paul Virilio, argues in Politics of the Very Worst that when you invent electricity, you immediately invent electro <coughs> electrocution. So the rise of remote own home apps like Nest, which is a smart heating technology company, that is basically a thermostat that you can control from outside of your home, but also it knows itself how to save energy. And where is the threshold between a thermostat knowing how to save energy and a thermostat knowing that you've used more than enough energy and automatically shuts off. So this is concerning, especially so when cyber experts are suggesting a future security nightmare of botnet armies using toasters to launch DDoS attacks, yet we're all still laughing at the thought that our homes could be out of our own control and toasters could set our homes on fire. So when we're undone of privacy, kicked out of our mortgage houses, blown away by storms and monitored by digital technology, Shelter really is a privileged term that most of us cannot even tap into or afford to. And with both material and digital borders clouded, the right to shelter has become the most contested of all human rights. Funnily enough, shelter is also the only proper spatial human right. So in our modern, individualized, connected, neoliberal societies, we demand the right to access, shelter, privacy, freedom, but somehow we forget to negotiate the implications of our citizenship while we're roaming, while we're roaming with our phones in Russia and we take the territorial implications of the shelter for granted. Shelter itself no longer being a thing nor a being, but rather a condition. And when the thick cables that run along the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean that carry and provide the world's emails, searches, phone conversations are increasingly exposed to the public due to the erosion of beach material and crazy sharks that bite them off, it's fair to wonder whether we've lost our case. However, um, Perhaps mass surveillance, control, digital access are becoming such integral parts of our societies that terms like shelter, similar to privacy, are changing their very meanings. As the ancient Roman notion of privacy, according to Hannah Arendt's book, The Human Condition, is not private how we know it, but a man who was private was not even considered fully human. Shelter, a term that was once about providing safety and humanity, might now take to challenging both the meaning and means of those two terms by ways of counter control. Especially, especially so when the most secure and surveilled places in this world, such as embassies, banks, or jails, are under constant attack while overly secured. So shelter is a term connected to a mise en being. Similar to architecture, the more walls you build, the more you divide, and the more securities you set in place, ironically, the less secure it is. In order to define shelter, it needs to be understood what it is we need shelter from. On the one hand, the very elements of architecture are no longer deaf and mute, but are listening, talking back, surveilling, and quantifying our behavior. If that were not problematic enough, leaders of our profession are advocating for a totalizing design strategy, claiming that the societal function of architecture is the spatial ordering of communicative interaction. Patrick Schumacher's style of parametricism relies on an agent-based semiology where programmed crowd-based agents algorithmically respond to the morphological clues in the built environment. Schumacher has embarked on a semiological project to design a system of signification as features of the built environment. Signs are altered during the design phase to modulate an agent's behavior through semantic meaning. Here, crowd and agent-based modeling is used to, as he states, generate the kind of communicative situations the client is aiming for within a space. In agent-based semiology, the agency of the architect is ceded to the client and aims to affect its user's behavior. Parametricism as a system of total signification results in spectacular, extravagant, and iconic architecture. In contrast to such spectacular and unique design, I've been thinking of a quote from Rem Koolhaas's essay in the 90s, The Generic City, where he says, in a reversal of expectation, it is repetition that has become unusual, therefore particularly daring, exhilarating. But that is for the 21st century. Precociously, repetition, sameness, and the generic have become topics of interest and discussion in the early 21st century. The trend forecasting group Cable introduced the term normcore in youth mode, a report on freedom. 
The report states, Normcore finds liberation in being nothing special. Normcore allows for strategic misinterpretation. To the receiver, it's confusing. Normcore capitalizes on the possibility of misinterpretation as an opportunity for connection. I'm interested in this confusing sign here, the misinterpretation as a form of shelter. Signifiers that simultaneously offer a sort of camouflage and an opportunity for connection. I'm sure everybody here has heard something in the news or not about cryptocurrency, blockchain technology, and decentralization without fully understanding it. In a recent tweet, the philosopher Nick Lamb states, cryptocurrency coins a diagonal concept. From the latent matrix of abundant signs and scarce things, it extracts the scarce sign. Shelter in the scarce sign is an opportunity for connection. The blockchain is a commonality, a possibility for community, and epistemic gain. It is not a product to be sold and explained to the masses, but to build and attract communities that already see its potential. Information on the blockchain is stored openly and transparent, yet cri cryptographic and hidden. There is a hidden, illegible, and mobile form of shelter available today within architecture, the practice of which we call, could call crypto architecture. Contrary to an aesthetic style that aims to be the dominant visual language of globalization, crypto architecture is formless. Crypto architecture is a strategy of radical closure and an opportunity to creatively engage contemporary market forces, a strategy that is inclusive but elusive, cryptographic in nature. Decentralization as a form of organization for architects can allow powerful and undeclared communities to work together on the urban and spatial implications and implementations of the blockchain technology, and by extension, use financial <laughs> tools to initiate clientless projects. The practice of crypto architecture is contingent on these undeclared communities, which currently exist as radically closed. This practice is perpetuated by actors connected by structures of similitude and likeness, unconcerned with explaining themselves to those who do not inher inherently register the value. Radical closure opens a space for actors to connect. A peer-to-peer -peer society does not emerge out of the heroic revolutionary narrative, but gradually as those who build the structure of a new society come together and connect with each other. The philosopher Reza Negaristani states, we can say that closure realizes openness in its radical sense, not as openness towards the possibility of contingencies from the outside, but as being opened by the contingent materials that form the work of a crypto architecture. Creative openness turns out to have been a distraction all along. The closure of the work is the only way to participate with and uncover the conspiracy of contingent materials. A political architecture today creates social and cultural exchange by drawing connections and generating unprecedented experiences that are interstitial to digital life. Crypto architecture is an architecture that has grown conscious to the conditions and borders of the language of networks and decentralized technology in relation to material constituted regimes of power. The unfulfilled utopian vision of cyberspace has been translated into a nomadic utopia of crypto architecture. Crypto architecture is a prepositional mode of existence, in between concepts, hubs, and nodes. Shelter is radically closed, scarce sign. Thanks. So this is going to differ a little bit because I, I wrote a piece of fiction for volume, I'm not an architect, um, and I guess I would characterize it as a piece of speculative autobiography. Over the spring I, I met my estranged father for the first time and sort of came up on the possibility of getting dual citizenship. And that sort of like started this, this obsession that I had, like what would it be like if I abandoned my American citizenship? So what would it be like if I... Uh, used my English father's Irish grandfather to get an Irish passport and got rid of my American one even though I'd never been to Ireland before. And sort of the whole uh, horrible scenario happening in the Mediterranean at the time made the whole thing seem a bit more ridiculous. So I'm just going to read from that. So I didn't plan this, my father says, as if I did, and immediately doubles down on convincing me that he made the right decision. This time I finally, I might, I might finally be convinced. The night before, I girded myself for him to be a total dick. In my imagination, he had gold circular spectacles, a tatty maroon sweater. 
He wore his Middle English stiff upper lip on his sleeve. And in my imagination, of course, he just didn't come. But then there he was, waiting awkwardly in the lobby of the Ace Hotel, as unsure as I am which of us will be the first to admit that we can recognize each other despite never having met. Brown shoes, jeans, zip-up black ripped cardigan, an orange jeep backpack, and a ponytail. Surprise, I can dress like an aging rocker and still keep your stiff upper lip. My first thought is, I hoped he'd be hotter. Isn't this what everyone worries about when they meet the other half of their estranged DNA? But there's less of a resemblance than I expected. It's still a mystery where I got my perfect teeth from, a blessing from the cosmopolitan gods, forever lending me the appearance of good breeding despite the fact that I secretly really lack it. No one in English believes they're real. More than once a stranger has noted their conspicuous straightness, then commented with a shudder of condescension to find Americans reserved for breast implants. In England, we prefer, we prefer natural teeth. I could tell that I could tell them I never had braces, but protesting and insinuation only makes it seem true. He tells me, I Google you. This both devastates and touches me. He tells me he used to live in Bethnal Green, a few blocks east of where I'm staying at the Ace. Before it was trendy, he assures me. Isn't this how everyone talks about everywhere? He obliquely mentions his sons. I don't mention that I had lunch with one of them three days before. Similarly, when I asked my brother about his family, he gave circumspect answers. I wonder if our circumspect plus atomized, plus compartmentalized way of dealing with each other is genetic. The only information he thinks to offer me unprompted is that he has no heritable diseases. Based on how hot he is, I don't know if I believe this. <laughs> His eyes are blue and watery, an Aryanized version of how I imagine Hagrid's. I can't tell if he's holding back tears or just has allergies. Is he sad? Is he proud? Is he a robot? I fully fail to comprehend the English, the politics of their accents, their love-hate relationship with all things boisterous and aggressive in American, why they seem to really resent my teeth. Whenever I tell someone about my plot to secure a passport from the United Kingdom, they look at me incredulously. Englishness isn't an abstraction the way Americanness is. It's a lived experience, a tangible navigation of class politics and accents, and above all history. Maybe this is why there's so little guilt about all the horrors of colonialism. They invaded the Indians and the Normans invaded the English. In the long run, it's all a wash. I'm always already discounted from this history, before I even speak, as soon as I open my mouth. The bits of paper, the abstract parts, that's what Britishness is for. When I tell my father I want UK citizenship, he's straightforward. It's impossible. The specifics of my birth are explicitly excluded. Born abroad, parents unmarried, British national involved as a father. But his father, my grandfather, was Irish. He himself used to travel on an Irish passport, despite being born in the UK. For some reason, it was easier in the 80s to get an Irish passport in shrugs. Diaspora countries are always easier. The colonizers are always more limited to the immutability of history than the colonized. If you think an EU passport would be useful, this is something I can get to for you. I can get you the proper documents. explanation, a projection, um, a, a fiction of what this image means. Um, it is. It was published on the cover of Casa Bella magazine in March 1976. But um, it is a piece called uh, "A Piece of Nature: Einstück Natur" by Hausrucker Co. And um, it was interesting to me when um, when Nick sent me the um, the call for shelter was. The idea of the primitive hut by Marc Antoine Logier, completely encased in, and sealed in this jar, presented like a fossil, meaning that this hut was already dead as it was presented like a fossil in this image. But what exactly was dead? The idea of shelter, the idea of nature as an unbounded, free uh, land, 
um, in, in many respects, in the, at the time that it was, that the image was, uh, that the project really was constructed, it was 1972, and um, it was reflecting a very intense anxiety of an environmental crisis, the oil crisis, the image of the earth um, understood as a finite system and the, and the kind of fear that in order to preserve some pieces of nature, we might have to seal them and preserve them in these enclosed worlds, which is also a prelude to the exhibition coming up here at the storefront in February called Closed Worlds. Uh, but most interestingly is how the icon of the hut is preserved um, and the question is what lies beyond the surface? What is it, what are the sort of equipment, machinery, and systems required to create this idea? And is the hut a kind of fake image disguising something else? Do we need it? And, um, and what is it that, uh, that really uh, defines a closed world or a piece of nature? Um, maybe I'll use the next images since I'm talking kind of like in a PowerPoint mode. Um, at the time that the image was published, it was a response to this issue of Architectural Magazine. It was published two months ago in, um, in AD. It's an ink illustration by Cliff Harper presenting, um, it, it was called Autonomous Housing. So the idea of autonomy, of detachment from the, from the urban fabric was, uh, was presented under, uh, heralded under the theme of autonomy from the grid of energy supplies um, with this kind of, um, here you see, autonomous property keep out. So it really was announcing a kind of detachment, a kind of seclusion uh, from the rest of the world and the reconstitution of a new world within these artificial boundaries. Um, but most interestingly, it was also presenting a kind of lost version of the world as we know it under this bucolic version of the hut and uh, these cows uh, in the background. So what will these things mean relative to these images that House Record Co. were publishing parallel to these uh, kind of icons of nature. Um, and this is a project called, uh, I, I think, hold on, Environment Transformer. I just want to make sure I get it right. Um, this is a very similar one called Oase Number no. 7. Both of them really understanding not just the kind of bubble as an organization of containment, but also the bubble as a kind of existential uh, separation from the urban sphere um, and, um, and, and the sustenance of this new world within a larger context. So, um, I'll, um, this is interesting to me. Uh, this is another image of the bubble, but not as an icon, not, not as a kind of, um, of, of, of a barrier within which things can be packed, contained, and reorganized, but as a, as, a system, as a system, as an organizational format, as the habitat which becomes a giant stomach that needs the individual, the excrements of it, and this is what you see here. Uh, this is the person that is like shitting here and everything. This becomes extremely important. The dirtiness and messiness of that kind of rustic bucolic organization becomes fundamental to the way shelter is defined. So um, what I guess I, I don't have a definitive definition of shelter, but I do, uh, I do want to bring up the, the realm of dirtiness beyond the realm of the political or the realm of dirtiness interwo interwoven inside the realm of the political um, with these types of images and what it really takes uh, to reconstitute these icons of domesticity um, as what we call sustainable systems today. I guess, uh, I don't want to read, so thank you. So yes, <clears throat> yesterday Nick came and said, Eva, will you make the favors of articulating some of the questions around? And um, I guess if one is to start by defining shelter almost as the teeth or the passport of our, uh, uh, of our uh, dream identity or past identity, 
Maybe I will start by something that is to come at the storefront in the way beyond the glow system is a project that is called um, Architectural Conflicts or Architectural Conflicts to try to understand in which circumstances architecture has been able to really either unveil or resolve a particular conflict. And when you were talking about elements and uh, what elements architecture should shelter itself from instead of what elements architecture is made of, um, I think the idea of trying to change the diagram, and understanding that the diagram is not a closed figure, but it's actually a figure of articulation of different forces, um, is something that I think architecture really needs to start formulating. Uh, Mr. P, that has appeared twice, and I, I really don't have any interest in, in talking about, um, I think misses the point, in fact, that architecture is something more than just an object. It actually is an object which has agency. And the idea here is that, as you say, shelter is not a noun, it's a verb. Even if it can be an intransitive verb, um, I, I want to invite everyone to think about and help us contribute this archive of architectural conflicts, because we are going to try to understand to, through 10 different escapes, from the domestic to the collective to the urban to the metropolitan, territorial, national, international, and global, what architectural evidences have we had that have been able, again, to either unveil or resolve particular conflicts. Um, with that said, um, I, I was fascinated by Mr. Koch uh, uh, and, and his, um, his way of really bringing um, uh, the, the question of homelessness into a space of, um, uh, of conflict, of real conflict that New York uh, 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 faced way back in the 80s. And Stoffer had an exhibition here that was called Homeless at Home where um, architects were called actually in designing shelters. And there has been a huge tradition of many of the architects from Tsushima to Toyohito where their architectural practice started by the sheer definition of a shelter that was not always for a homeless, but was for the definition of the contemporary subject that in this case, as Vera was saying, is not anymore just protecting itself from the elements as we used to call them traditionally, but from data, from political oppression, from all kind of different uh, forces that are actually endangering um, who we are and how we operate. Part of the uh, part of the questions that we have been asking over the last few years, when we had um, the strategies for public occupation when Occupy Wall Street was asking actually storefront to design shelter for them, for the Liberty uh, Park, we said we cannot help you building shelter, but we can help you producing structures of negotiation between the civil society and the structures of political and economical power. So that competition was formulated as a resistance towards just the production of shelter understood as a kind of traditional sense. But I think one of the fascinating points that actually Ryan you brought in is how do we think of that, almost of confusion, of cryptocurrency, of this space of total ambiguity, that what it does is try to bring us together in different forms, is actually a shelter against the spaces of total separation that maybe there's a consequence of like the neo-capitalist and neoliberalist society of, of the construction of the individual and the self. Um, to end up with somehow what Lydia brought in, that is this diagram in which each one of those spheres tries to understand the relationship of the human subject to particular elements and how a closed system is always close in relationship to a particular ideological construct. So that's my summary, if that was my job. Um, uh, of what I think was brought into, into the table. So I, I might have new teeth and I might have all kinds of different things after this. But um, maybe for me the, the question goes back into some of the, the real issues in which what is that that architecture is and architecture is not. And I think that, um, um, Nick, you, you brought a moment in which you say, you know, um, Usually architecture is understood as that excess, and actually tomorrow I'm in a studio by, by Leong Leong that talks about what um, uh, Bob Stern used to call fat. And he said that architecture only exists in when architecture loses its function, and it engages with the space of fat, with that kind of ornamentation of Grand Central Station. And, um, and of course the question then goes in reclaiming the fact that architecture is the essence, is the ultimate irreductibility of its function, of its closed system into something that actually really, truly matters. So in the shelters of the of the beta worst, or of the very worst, um, I, I love that uh, that uh, uh, quote to Virilio, 
I think it would be very interesting if um, if you would try to bring back um, some of the most important questions. That is, what is the role of the architect today in addressing some? And for me, the idea that architectural conflicts as a project tries to almost be an alternative to the Python atlas, in which architecture is seen just as a surface and in which we are able to provide a space of convergence by which architecture is able to demonstrate and manifest itself as a, as a real political instrument, right? Um, where do you position shelter in relationship to architecture? And I think you, you stated that at the very beginning, but maybe now is a good time to try to close that back and maybe then uh, we can open these things, uh, the questions to, to the audience. But I want to, to throw all those different notions of shelter and all these different possibilities from, from the, the politics uh, um, um, to, in a certain way, the poetics that have been uh, thrown into the table. What's the role of architecture uh, for you today? Because ultimately, shelter is like almost as a kind of um, a, a substitute to actually just simply say architecture, right? As, as we have learning to be. So, Sure. I mean, I actually think the, the the example that you mentioned of how Storefront responded to Occupy Wall Street um, is quite uh, emblematic in how I would position the role of the architect. And it's not necessarily because I agree, uh, even though I do, in the way that that response was formulated. But I think it embodies uh, it, it embodies something much more fundamental with regards to the question of shelter. And one of the main questions that we uh, dealt with in the formulation of this issue is. Uh, a potentially uh, reactive nature to the concept and, and, a, and a, almost a regressive nature. And, and I think this is actually um, something that, that I'll, I mean, I'll, I'll explain a little bit more, but it's, it's interesting to kind of see it as a lens through which to, to see all the presentations today. Um, and which I think is really one of the most kind of in, in essential critiques to, uh, with, with Lydia's project of Closed Worlds. Um, is, you know, it, is shelter a... <coughs> Is shelter a boundary? And if it is a boundary, uh, is it a fixed boundary or is it a porous boundary? It does. And then in this sense, I would also uh, extend this to uh, to the Occupy Wall Street, is does the architect provide interiors? Does Is the architect the one who prescribes, you know, the, the you know, what one else calls home? Or does it, let's say, provide the conditions for, for, for others to let's say, to, to articulate that. Um, so I, I think the, the, the very interi the interiorness, not necessarily in, in thinking about the interiority of an architectural discourse, but in just is, you know, how much is the inside inside and how much is the outside outside? And I think that there are certain, uh, there are certainly uh, points in, let's say, Bear's uh, contribution where just data deluge is really forcing us to rethink, uh, you know, can we even keep the outside out? And can we keep the inside in? And it's the exact same question with, with the closed worlds. And I think, that this um, is is perhaps translated in, in, a, in quite an interesting way with, with the response to the role of the architect as well. Yeah. I mean, I think the total definition of what are those spheres, right, that constitute this membrane, that where the inside and the outside might be reversed, in which there is no, um, it's not drain anymore that what actually attacks, but they are all kind of different matters that uh, one needs to produce spaces of like zero accessibility to uh, 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 satellite, uh, 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 connections. I think it's. I think it is the role of the architect to actually determine what is that that the shelter today is and means, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and I think that that definition of interiority and exteriority is something that we all do know that that the space outside uh, uh, sometimes becomes this entire space of anonymity in which one can actually feel uh, at home outside. I would like to open it to the audience for questions, comments, uh, definitions. The definition series is always open to anyone who wants to bring. Uh, their own um, their own words into the stage. Professor Molly, does anyone have any questions for any of the individual participants? Okay. It's very. Yes, you need the mic. <laughs> Can you pass it? So the question is actually for you. Um, Having moved to the US, not having an American passport, and having studied the kind of threshold between identity, uh, legal documents, etc., do you feel, first of all, sheltered by your American passport? And what was the reason, or, or how do you see shelter connected to your kind of 
a query whether you could get another passport. I, mean, I, I think passports are obviously forms of shelter. Um, just living in New York and knowing a lot of friends who don't have American green cards who are from abroad, it's, you know, it entirely determines like how you can live, how you can work, how you can support yourself, what rights you have to exist in a specific space. Um, and also just, I mean, <coughs> I think you get treated differently based on which passport you use to enter or exit specific countries. Um, the first time I traveled abroad, I went to Brazil, which is one of the few countries that is adversarial, I think, with the United States on a lot of like weird immigration issues. N not in a bad way, but they, they have a policy of charging as much for a visa for you to enter their country as you charge for them, which most countries don't do to Americans. And the process of getting a visa from Brazil was like so onerous and terrible, and the friend I was traveling with almost couldn't even enter the country because they told her her passport was too dirty and they made her go get a new one on um, like the maybe three days before our flight or something like that. And that whole experience I think is pretty foreign to Americans for the most part, but I think it's not foreign for most people um, who have, you know, passports from non-Western countries or from less developed countries where there's always, you know, this sort of like suspicion that you're trying to sneak into the country and work. I realize that it's almost 8.30 and we have gone through a nice hour and 15 minutes. Um, there is a, a, a competition that we are running that is called um, Taking Buildings Down. And, and, and I, was, I always use that question as a way to try to wonder um, what is that that we have had enough? What is that that we don't want more, right? And um, when you were showing some of those images of, uh, I mean, and of course, frontiers and borders and passport control checks and the immigration services, I mean, would be my top list. Someone who's still holding that document that doesn't allow me to be who I'm supposed to be, meaning a world citizen. Um, but but maybe if we were to think, right, of like, there is always like a political consequence in that act of erasure. If we actually look into refugee camps and if we take them down, it means that there is an entire political system that should be taken down, right? And and that becomes the manifestation of a political uh, act that w goes way beyond. Um, when you were talking about um, about Grand Central Station, and I was thinking about uh, what happens if we actually would try to uh, erase all the architectures that have, in a certain way, um, not allowed for any kind of citizenship to actually express itself as such. Is that a kind of history of oppression, the way in which you now, I will not be able to see the sky of Grand Central Station under the same light, right? And I think the question then is, is what is that that is being demolished? And what is that that is being erased? And what is that that we need to, um, maybe not to produce a shelter, but to start taking away and that might give us some clues about how we start thinking about it. So, without any, please. Yeah. Um, that brought me to something very interesting that you said at the very beginning about um, the refugee camps. Um, and something similar happens in the discussion with homeless, which is like, for sure we don't wanna ask questions as how you know any of those typologies is perfectly built. You were mentioning that CGM, a lot of people have tried to do homeless shelters. I do believe that Coalition for the Homeless, which is like a, a legal group, is the one who should be asked about what the architecture of the homeless is about. But um, there was this, uh, this um, text by Slavok Sizek about Norway precisely, which said that there is a problem also in considering these situations exceptional, right? We might not want to consider, consider them structural, like we might not want to consider that this might be happening in the long time, but resolve it. But also this has its own risks, which is what happened with homelessness, for example, which is like people <coughs> was unwilling to admit that this was a structural problem of the real estate, economics, etc., of this city, right? People was wanting to treat it as exceptional, transitory, in changes we won't be Ha uh, having to think about neither policies about special uh, neither special politics of uh, homeless shelters etc. But like right now the level of homeless is like higher than ever. So how do we deal with that without asking the wrong question, which is what's the better design, but not considering exceptional either, not considering that you know uh, it should be solved and it should be solved. It has a, let's say a caduce uh, um, an expiration date, right? 
I mean, I, I think it's, I'm glad that you do know that right now we have as many homeless as we had in the 80s, yet we are not seeing them, right? The politics of exclusion and sending people to particular peripheries. And, and uh, today I was just having a conversation about uh, housing and, and the entire question of affordable housing is a huge one, and not only in New York, but also in LA, and I think mostly in the United States, uh, uh, a context that has never really truly understood what it means to produce inhabitation for uh, uh, its, its like society beyond uh, an economic model that is the suburban home and with all the different loans and attachments that go with it. But so the, I think the question goes in into <coughs> the fact that shelter is not a noun. And I think that that to me is, is the, the ultimate um, uh, uh, definition, right? Um, in which suddenly shelter is an, is an active uh, um, space by which one uh, produces a space of protection in relationship to many forces. And those are political, economical, and, 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 and of course as well environmental. And then, so the definition of that and to actually force uh, ourselves as architects or artists or whoever we want to call ourselves to take the responsibility of being able and capable of designing and articulating the social, political, and economical forces that architecture needs to respond. Not all of them are brave enough to do that. Some of them, they just like are happy with one, and then we are called P, right? But so the question is, is how do we really embrace the act of taking that responsibility in our shoulders? And I think that's, that's not the easy one. And we don't always have to carry them on. We do have to have spaces for experimentation. And I think that that's mostly what this space is about, but also about the articulation of the paths by which we can really make meaningful actions towards the production of, of shelters that go beyond uh, uh, spaces of ornamentation or ideological ornamentation. So I think we are done. We're going to drink some wine. Please buy the magazines. We don't want to send them back to the Netherlands. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, so I, I was, it was, uh, I was kind of sad to like run by McNally Jackson and to speak to the contributors that they had not received their copy of the issue yet. So this is actually the first time that this issue is being released anywhere and available for purchase anywhere in the United States. So it is, to be a salesman here, it is at a, at a special launch price, $20. Uh, please do not make me bring these back to the Netherlands. They're very heavy. Yes. Thank you very much. By the Thank way, you. Yes. This is amazing to be here. Oh,